Last week we looked at uh, Revelation chapter 16. And we witnessed as those final judgments were poured out on the people of the earth. Judgment that was poured out on those who rejected Christ. Nothing like this has ever happened before on the earth. It'll be devastating. The people will see their flesh rot right off their bones. They'll see the oceans and the rivers turned to blood. The heat of the sun will scorch them. They'll be in agony. They'll be in pain. A violent earthquake will collapse cities of the world. It'll reshape the geography of the world. Hailstones, 100 pound hailstones will fall from the sky like deadly missiles. But still, we're told the people will not repent and turn from their sin and turn to Christ. I don't know what's more incredible. The things that happened are the fact that they won't turn to Christ. It all sounds incredible, doesn't it? So incredible that many people don't believe that it will really take place. They don't think it will happen. But just like the days of Noah, judgment will come and there will be no escape. And like Noah, we have been given the responsibility to warn the people people of the wrath that is coming. After this final series of judgments that we read about last week, the next thing that happens, Jesus Christ returns to earth. He returns to set up his kingdom. But that doesn't happen until Revelation chapter 19. We're in chapter 17. And as we've seen several times as we've gone through the book of Revelation, God has stopped along the way to fill in the blanks for us. And that's what he does here. He does it in chapter 17. He does does it in chapter 18. He does it, he stops, and he gives us some additional information. Uh, He gives us uh, an understanding of the details, of the strategy that the enemy will use. He shows us what part false religion will play in that strategy. And he shows us how God will use it, all of it, as part of his plan, as part of his purpose. Religion, that's the subject of today's message. Religion can be defined simply as a set of beliefs, a set of values, a set of practices that recognizes that there is a supernatural power or influence somewhere in the universe. That definition certainly leaves a lot of room for a wide variety of interpretations as to who or what that supernatural power is, doesn't it? Just talk to ten people and you'll get ten different perspectives on religion. Every culture, every civilization, from the most primitive to the most complex, has had a set of beliefs that they call their religion. Why is that? It's the way God has created us. He has created us to be worshipers. John 4, Jesus said that God looks for worshipers. He seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's the problem. On our own, we don't worship God that way. We don't worship him as the one true God. In fact, Romans 3.11 says that no one seeks after him. That's left the door wide open for the enemy to walk in with a whole set of false teaching, false religions. What Paul called in 1 Timothy 4, 1, doctrines of demons. Maybe the religion of our family. Maybe the re- religion that we, we've grown up believing in. Maybe the religion of our culture. Or it just may be a set of beliefs that we have come up with in our own minds that we believe are true about God. But whatever it is, it's false. 
false religions. And even though we don't seek God, we are told that God seeks us. He seeks those to worship him. What did Jesus say in Luke 19? He said of himself, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that is what he still does today. He seeks us. He finds us. He draws us to himself and he saves us. And then he makes us worshipers, true worshipers, disciples of Jesus Christ, part of the true church of God. But during the tribulation, the true church will be gone. We will be in heaven, taken away before the tribulation begins. There will be those who will come to Christ during the tribulation. Yes, that's true. But after chapter 3 in Revelation, we don't read about the church functioning as the true church. Why? Because false religion will dominate the earth. In Revelation chapter 17, God gives us some insight into what this false religion will be like. Chapter 16, John is watching as seven angels are pouring out seven bowls of judgment on the earth. He's amazed at what he sees. He says then in verse 1 of chapter 17 that one of those angels, one of those angels who poured out one of those bowls came up to him. It says, verse 1, he spoke to him. And he talked to him and he said, come here. He said, I will show you. The exosoi. I will, I will help you to understand. And I'll explain to you, he says, about the judgment. The krima in Greek. The judgment, verse 1 says, of the great harlot. The pornes, megales. The judgment of the one who has sold herself into sin. He says, I'll show you the destruction of false religion. False religion that has been a part of man's civilization since man has lived upon the earth in in one form or another. We've had false religion with us. He says, I will show you, verse 1, the harlot who sits on many waters. This false religion will cover the earth. Verse 15 tells us that these waters are the peoples, the individuals, the multitudes, the crowds, the nations, those of every language in the world. False religion will dominate the entire world. It will be like it is spiritual fornication. This false religion sits, we are told, as as one in authority, as one having power. This religion will rule the people of the world because it will rule their hearts and their minds. And it will rule like a queen sitting on a throne. We see that beginning today, don't we? We see false religion that cuts across gender and race, We see people following blindly. We see how they are enslaved to these false religions and they don't even know that they're following doctrines of demons. It would be a little bit different during the tribulation. Even though this religion will dominate the world, it won't be like it is today where there are many false religions to choose from. There will only be one worldwide religion. The people will be lost in the lie. It's almost difficult to imagine, isn't it, that the entire world will will have one religion? That they'll all come together? But we see some of that today, don't we? We see the, the councils that encourage people to come together, the religious leaders to meet and to put leave their beliefs at the door so that they they can do something good for mankind. We're told to coexist. 
We're told to stop being so narrow-minded. We're told to just live and let live. During the tribulation, we're told. Verse 2, the kings, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the leaders of the nations of the world will embrace this false religion. They'll sell themselves to it, it says in verse 2, like they have committed acts of immorality. Pornuo in Greek, where we get our English word, pornography. It says they will commit spiritual fornication. Why? Why will national and worldwide leaders in government and in business care about religion? Why will they buy into it? They'll buy into it because they'll think there's something they can get out of it. Through this false religion, the Antichrist will promise them success. And who doesn't want success? He will promise them stability. And what government doesn't want? Stability. He will promise them prosperity. Who doesn't want prosperity? And he will promise to cure all of the economic and the political and the social problems if everyone will come together around this false religion. It's what the people have dreamed about. It's what we've all dreamed about. World peace. Oh, but it's something that seemed to be beyond us, isn't it? But it will seem like it is becoming a reality. And so they will buy into the lie. Jeremiah 10, verse 21 says this, The shepherds have become stupid. They have not sought the Lord. Jeremiah 12, 10, God says this, They have ruined my vineyard. They have trampled down my field. All of the presidents and the prime ministers, all of the kings and the priests and the pastors, all of the leaders in government and in business, all of the religious leaders will be deceived and they will lead the people away from God and into this false religion. And what about the people? Verse 2. It says, the people, those who dwell on the earth, it says, those who don't know Christ, he said, will be made drunk. Verse 2. Mathusko. It'll be like they're intoxicated. They won't be thinking clearly. It's like they're out of their minds, it says, verse 2, on the wine of her immorality. They will give their hearts and their minds and their lives to this false religion. Why? Because it'll promise them what? Health and wealth and safety. It'll promise to give them all of the things that they want and they crave. All of the things that make them feel good. In the end, it'll only bring eternal punishment. That is what religion will be like during the tribulation. It will spread across the earth like an infectious disease. Perhaps John was wondering, how could all this be? How could the people be so deceived? This angel has just told John that he was about to show him how false religion would be judged. I mean, that's what he said to him, but so far we haven't seen any encouragement in that area. So John, we're told, is carried away, verse 3, by this angel in the Spirit, wrapped in the power of the Holy Spirit. John is taken by this angel to a place, it says in verse 3, in the wilderness, in the Eremus, into a a desert, a desolate and an isolated place. Steps back from the situation. You know, sometimes it's not such a bad thing to be in the wilderness. Sometimes God takes us to a place where we are separated from other people. Where we are away from the crowd, away from the mainstream of life. And sometimes when we're in that place, that is the opportunity for him to speak to us clearly. 
The opportunity for us to listen, to hear what he has to say. To get his perspective. That's what he does with John. This angel takes him to a place of seclusion. And there, John says in verse 3, I saw a woman. He said, this woman was sitting on a scarlet beast. Well, we've seen this beast before, haven't we? This is the, the Therion, the wild beast that we saw in Revelation chapter 13, 14, and 16. It's the Antichrist. Here he's dressed up. We're told he's dressed in scarlet, dressed luxuriously, dressed like royalty. But Isaiah 118 says that he is also dressed in sin, as red, as scarlet, red like crimson. He is the one who supports this woman. He is the one who this false religion rests on. He is the one who gives it his approval. He approves of this false religion and he encourages everyone else to rally around it. Why? Because as the world economy and the the political stability begins to deteriorate, he will promise that if everyone will come together around this religion, all will be well. But he doesn't bring the people to God. That's not the kind of religion we're talking about here. Verse 3 says he's full of blasphemous names. His religion will be to slander the name of God. To be hostile to Christ. Daniel 11.36 says he will speak monstrous things against God. His kingdom will be like every other kingdom that the world has seen. Hostile to God. Hostile to Christ. He'll be like all of those who have come before. This beast, verse 3 says, the one who has seven heads, seven heads, seven kingdoms, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, that's six. One more. He is the seventh kingdom. The Antichrist is the seventh ruler of the seventh kingdom, But he'll be like all of them, profaning, cursing, mocking the true God. But he won't have to do it alone. We're told, verse 3, he has some help. It says he has some help from ten horns, ten men. Ten men who will be under his authority, and he will use them to accomplish his goals. And what's his first goal? Daniel 7.23 says that he will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it and he will use this false religion to do it verse 4 says this woman this religion is clothed she said it says she's clothed in purple she's clothed in scarlet She's adorned with gold and with precious stones and with pearls. She's dressed up. It says in her hand, she has a golden cup. It's religion. Dressed up for the world to see a worldwide church of prosperity and respectability. Attractive, inviting, desirable, successful. That's what religion will look like during the tribulation. But it only looks that way on the surface, doesn't it? Only on the outside. If we look a little closer at verse 4, if we look inside the cup, we're told that it is full of abominations. It is a cup full of disgusting things, unclean things. The impurity, it says, of her immorality. The warning, don't be deceived by appearances, not even when you're going to church. Remember when Jesus spoke to the the leaders of the nation, the Jewish nation, 
And he said to them in Matthew 23, 27, when he was speaking about their hypocrisy, he said, you are like whitewashed tombs. He said, you appear beautiful on the outside. He said, but inside, he said, you're full of dead men's bones. That's what this church will look like, this false religion. It will look good on the outside. It may appear they're saying the right things, he says, but inside, just like those leaders, he said, there will be no reverence for God. There will be no relationship with Christ. That's what the church will look like during the tribulation. We might not be too far from that today. Now, every church has a name, doesn't it? A name that identifies the church, that tells everybody who this church is, what they believe, what they stand for, what they're all about. Well, this false religion, this worldwide religion, has a name also. But it's a name that's given to it by God. Verse 5. It says it's a name that's written on her forehead. But the name that's written, it says is a mystery. It's a mysterion in Greek. It's something that's hidden. Something that hasn't been revealed to us. And it is a mystery called this, he says in verse 5. Babylon the Great. Well, we know Babylon's a city. Verse 18 in this chapter, in fact, says Babylon is a city. But it's more than a city. It's more than a geographic geographic location. If it was just a city... We could go to the Atlas and find it. Wouldn't be a mystery. It's something else. It's something else. It speaks, it speaks about the power and the influence of Babylon, of Babel. It's a picture of the rebellion of the nations against God. A picture of a world that's hostile to Christ. A picture of a world that is empowered by Satan. A picture of the source of all false religions. Verse 5. It is called the mother of harlots. The source of great abominations. It is the church of blasphemy and idolatry. And it will cover the earth, says in verse 5. False religions have always justified in, have justified themselves in killing those who don't follow the, their beliefs. That's the way it's been throughout history. This church will follow that pattern. It says in verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. This will be church sanctioned, church authorized murder. This church will kill the followers of Jesus Christ. And they'll do it in the name of religion. John is shocked. He's shocked by what he has just seen, by what he has just heard. After all, this angel told him in verse 1, he was going to show him judgment. This false religion would be under the krima, under the condemnation of death from God. But he hasn't seen that. And so it says in verse 6, when I saw her, he said, I wondered... Greatly. John's confused. He's frightened. He doesn't understand. So this angel helps him to understand. This angel said to me, verse 7, spoke to John and he said, Why do you wonder? He said, I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. The beast which has, he says, the seven heads and the ten horns. He says, I'll help you to understand. I'll explain it to you. I'll explain to you the relationship between false religion and the Antichrist. He said, but first, you need to understand some more details. He said, you need to understand some more details about the Antichrist. And that will help you to understand this relationship. 
So he says in verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss. He said he's the one who will appear to have been murdered. He's the one who will then appear to rise from the dead. But this angel says, his true power comes from the abyss. It comes from the pit. It comes from Satan himself. And yes, this angel says in verse 8, he will go to destruction. He will be thrown into a lake of fire forever. But when he appears, when he appears to come back to life, verse 8 says, those who dwell on the earth will wonder. He said, they will be amazed. They'll be deceived, he says. Why? He says, because they don't know Christ. Why? He says, verse 8, because their names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. They're deceived, he says, when they see this beast that was and is not and will come. He'll get the attention of the world. All eyes will be on him. The focus will shift from this false religion and it will shift to him. He'll no no, no longer need this false religion to unify the world. Why? The world will be unified around him. Pay attention, John says. Uh, The angel tells John, pay attention. John tells us, pay attention. He says, pay attention to what I'm about to say next, verse 9. He said, here is the mind which has wisdom. Only those who have the wisdom of God will be able to understand, he said, what I am about to tell you. Maybe only those who live through the tribulation will really be able to understand what this means. But he says this, verse 9. He says, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Well, we know from Revelation chapter 13, the seven heads are what? We are told they are seven kingdoms, right? Kingdoms that have been seen throughout history. But now we're told that they not only represent kingdoms, they represent kings, rulers. And we're told they represent mountains, Well, in the Bible, mountains sometimes are used to represent power and strength. Psalm 30, verse 7, the psalmist there says, O Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. The psalmist says, through you, through your strength and your power, I have become strong like a mountain. So now this angel tells John, These seven kingdoms are seven powerful kingdoms with a powerful leader in each of those kingdoms. But he says some of those kingdoms are gone. Some some of them are in the past. He says in verse, verse 10, five have fallen and one is. Who would that be? That would be Rome, right? In John's day, Rome was the dominant power in the world. And he says in verse 10, the other has not yet come. It's an empire with a strong leader that is still in the future. Someone who is yet to come. And when he comes, verse 10 says, he will remain a little while. It's the empire of the the Antichrist, right? Remember back in Revelation 13, we are told that he would rule for how long? said 42 months. A little while. Three and a half years. And the beast, verse 11, which was and is not, this angel says, is something else. Just when we thought we understood. He says he is also an eighth. What? An eighth? How can he be the seventh ruler and also be the eighth ruler? Maybe John was thinking the same thing. How can he be both? Here's how, verse 8. It says that he was, and is not, and is to come. When he appears on the world scene, 
He is the seventh ruler. But then he appears to die. He's gone. Then he appears to come back to life. Now he's the eighth ruler. The seventh and the eighth. Verse 11 says, yes, he is one of the seven, just in case we didn't get it. The seventh and the eighth ruler. But in the end, the angel reminds us in verse 11, he goes to destruction. Whether he's the seventh or the eighth, it doesn't matter, this angel says. Both he and his kingdom will be destroyed. And the horns, verse 12. The ten horns, this angel says, that you saw. He said, there are ten kings. There are ten rulers, he says in verse 12, but they haven't received a kingdom. It's not that kind of a king. He says, but they will receive authority, exoisia in Greek, jurisdiction. They are given jurisdiction and authority by the Antichrist to carry out his plan. Verse 12 says, with the beast for one hour, ora, for a moment in time. And in that moment of time, their moment of time, they will live for one purpose, we're told. To give their power and authority to the beast. They will all have the same goal. They'll have the same agenda. They will, they will have unity of purpose. They'll all follow the beast, we're told. And they'll follow him all the way into battle against Christ. Look what it says in verse 14. It says, they will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Nikael, he'll conquer them. Why? The angel says, here's why. Because it's Christ. He's Lord of lords and King of kings. Of course he'll win. He says, and there are those, verse 14, who are with him, who are with Christ. Those who are with Christ, when he returns to the earth to defeat these rulers, those who are there with him in this battle. So who are they? Who are those who are with Christ when he returns? Well, this angel says, verse 14, he says they are the called. They are the kletos, the invited ones. He says in verse 14, they are the chosen, the eklektos, the selected ones. He says they are the faithful, the pistos, those who have believed, those who have been obedient to Christ. Who would that be? Who do you think he's bringing back with him to earth? That would be us who know Christ. He brings us back, Revelation 19, 14 says, as an army, the armies of heaven. That's how it all ends, this angel says. And the waters, verse 15, the waters which you saw, he said, yes, they are the people and the multitude and the nations. Those of every language over which this harlot, this false religion will rule. He says, but now you understand a little bit more. He says, now, now you're going to be able to understand the the relationship between this false religion and the Antichrist. He says this. Here it is, verse 16. He says, the ten horns, the ten rulers, those that you saw, he said, and the beast, the Antichrist, he said, these... He said, these will hate the harlot. Miseo. He said, they will despise this false religion. They'll hate this system. But they'll use it. They'll use it to get control of the people's minds and their hearts and their lives. And when they have done that and when they don't need it any longer, what will they do? Verse 16. It says, they will make her death Desolate, Aramu, like a desert. It says verse 16, they will eat her flesh. Estheo, the consumer. 
And in verse 16 it says, they will burn her up with fire. They will destroy this false religion. This false religion will be violently destroyed. And even though it's the Antichrist who gives the order to destroy her, even his actions, this angel says, are under the sovereign hand of God. Verse 17, it says, For God put it in their hearts to execute His purpose. His purpose is accomplished through them. Their purpose? Verse 17. They have a common purpose. It says their purpose will be to give their kingdom, to give their allegiance to the beast. That's what they'll do. But why will they do it? Verse 17 says, they'll do it until the words of God should be fulfilled. Everything that they do, they do because God allows them to do it. That's the picture, this angel says. He said, don't you see? Don't you see how it's all going to come out in the end now? He says, yes. Verse 18, the woman whom you saw is a great city. She is a worldwide religion. She reigns over the kings of the earth, but she will be judged and she will be destroyed by God. And he will use the Antichrist to do it. Why? Go back to the verse that we had at the beginning. Isaiah 42, verse 8. What does the Lord say? He says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. He is the eternal God, the one who gives us life, the one who delights to give us eternal life. Who would dare to take his glory for themselves? Who would dare to give his glory to anyone or anything else? What he demands, he deserves. May our lives bring glory to him. May nothing get in the way of him, of worshiping him, of loving him. May we live to bring honor and glory and praise to our Lord and Savior. listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.